Welcome to the Friends of Dan Music Podcast. I'm Dan Miles. My guest today, Alan Holdsworth, is one of the most influential guitarists in the history of the instrument. His name appears on a very short list of truly visionary players like Django Reinhardt, Jimi Hendrix, and Eddie Van Halen, whose musical imaginations and unprecedented technical ability have led countless guitarists to completely rethink their approach to the instrument and forever expanded its vocabulary and sheer possibilities. On April 7th, 2017, he'll be releasing a 12-CD box set featuring remastered versions of all 11 of his groundbreaking solo albums from 1982's IOU through 2001's Flat Tire, plus his 2003 live album, Then. This epic career retrospective is called The Man Who Changed Guitar Forever, the Alan Holdsworth Album Collection. While that title is entirely appropriate, I can guarantee you that it was not Alan's idea to call it that, as he's always been quite modest about his achievements as a soloist and composer. The set will also include a comprehensive 40-page booklet, and even though it's well worth the investment, understandably a 12-disc set is bound to be on the pricey side. So on the same day, he'll also be releasing a two-CD set featuring 28 tracks he has handpicked as examples of his finest moments. Though we're recording this interview in March and neither product has been officially released, I'm happy to say I am in possession of an advanced copy of the two CD set, which is called Idolin, the Alan Holdsworth Collection. So we're going to be able to listen to samples from the new remastered collection. I'm going to start things off with one of my personal favorite Holdsworth compositions, featuring one of my all-time favorite Holdsworth solos. For longtime fans of Alan's, this will serve as a nice reminder of his epic skill, and for the uninitiated who will be experiencing his artistry for the first time, well, prepare to have your mind blown. As originally featured on his 1985 Metal Fatigue album, featuring Jimmy Johnson on bass and Chad Wackerman on drums, here is the newly remastered version of Alan's composition, Devil Take the Hindmost.
Joining me on the phone from San Diego, California, is Alan Holdsworth. Welcome. Thank you. Well, through the courtesy of your co-producer, Dan Perloff, I have an advanced copy of the two-disc set you'll be releasing next month. I recently drove from L.A. to Phoenix, and I took the opportunity to listen to all 28 tracks uninterrupted. So the first oh. thing I want to do... <laughs> it, was, it was exciting. Um, so the first thing I want to do is compliment you on the sequencing of the album. You know, I appreciate how the tracks flow together. It isn't purely chronological in either direction, but musically it's logical. I was wondering because I said, well, this isn't you know, front to back, back to front. But as I listened to the tracks, you know, it all made sense. And the second thing I want to compliment you on is how good it sounds. I did uh, side-by-side comparisons with the earlier versions, and there's a noticeable improvement. So what were your specific goals uh, for remastering this material? Well, uh, I relied on Dan for that because he, he had a, a mastering company and a mastering engineer that he really liked to work with. So they sent samples of all the tracks, and I thought he did a wonderful job, actually, considering that uh, the source material isn't particularly the further back you go. It wasn't, uh, wasn't as good as the newer ones, obviously. But I think he did a wonderful job on it. Yeah, all the instruments sound very present. But to me, it's the drums that really stand out. They have a depth and a rumble to them that wasn't there before. Because I wasn't listening to downloads. I uh, was putting CDs, the actual discs, into my you know bow system in the car. And I was going, oh, my, this, this sounds really great. An exclusive feature of the set is a previously unreleased version of the song Road Games with Jack Bruce on lead vocals instead of Paul Williams. Uh, what was the story behind that? Well, the story behind that actually was the part of, I had a, a big war with uh, Ted Templeman, who was a fantastic producer, as you know. One of the problem with his, when I signed with Warner Brothers, they didn't really give me enough upfront of what they wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. And I think I wanted to do what kind of I thought I would do before, which is to do exactly what I wanted. <laughs> but <laughs> imagine that. But they, uh, they decided that they wanted to um, change it and Ted what didn't like the Paul Williams for some reason. And I, I loved Paul actually. I thought he was fabulous, but um, he wanted me to uh, use different people and kind of force the issue. And in, in the end, I kind of just gave up on it. And that's why the original album just says produced, produced by circumstance. Cause <laughs> we were supposed to have at least eight to 10 tracks on there. And we only ended up doing six. And then I was uh, unceremoniously dropped by the label. <laughs> Which right. is fine, because what happened was that in the contract, it said that they had to pay for me to do another demo. So I went back to the studio of my choice and recorded uh, Metal Fatigue. And just, it was a bureaucrat, you know, I just had to send the tape to uh, Ted Templeman, which they just declined. I don't think he even listened to it. But the fact is that they ended up paying for the majority of uh, <laughs> Metal Fatigue. And I, I gave that to my friend, Bill Hine, who uh, was the the boss at uh, Enigma Records. But yeah. getting back to your question, yeah. was that uh, uh, Jack was on the original, uh, uh, original, well, actually, it was Paul on everything originally, but then we uh, replaced him with Jack and that, because it was part of the deal. So, yeah. uh, and I couldn't get out of that. But eventually what happened was we'd recorded it, obviously, with Jack, and then... Ted Templeman never came to the studio once and he listened to all of the mixes over the phone in the end because I figured that he knew that we weren't going to agree to differ or whatever. So he said, uh, okay, well, uh, you just go finish it yourself. So I took the tape back to, uh, I snipped the tape out of Warner Brothers and took it back to the music grinder and uh, did a mix with Paul on it, which is why Paul was on only on the original version. Yeah, but but we don't. We already have the Jack Bruce version, and I love Jack, obviously. Yeah. So I thought it would be interesting for people to hear Jack sing that song. So I decided to use that version as opposed to the original. I know from your perspective, Road Games was very problematic. It's always a sen- going to be a sentimental favorite for me, simply because it was my personal entry point to your solo work. But of course, Jack Bruce and Paul both sang vocals on the album, and so it was interesting to see that. Um, resurface now and uh i like both performances but you know the one that's been in my head all these years is paul's um i don't have the 12 disc set yet but i reviewed the track listing for more exclusive content people can look for uh, there are three bonus tracks on disc seven which are tokyo dream and the unmerry go round parts four and five which i believe have been released before but only in japan 
On disc 12, there's a bonus version of Funnels. And on disc 10, there's a track called Material Unreal, which is the title I don't recognize. Um, what's the, the story behind that track? Well, basically, it was just, uh, I, I think it was just like an instrumental version of it. I, I think there was no vocals on that track, for what I remember. Gotcha. I just added that, actually, as a bonus track on the 16 Men of Tame, but it was a limited edition that uh, Eddie Jobson added to it when he was distributing that record for a short time. I just used that version on this album. Yeah, well, as I said, I haven't heard um, the 12 disc set yet, so I only was able to read the track listing. But you know, the real point of it is just to hear the remastered collection, and I'm looking forward to that. What I want to know, uh, just more generally, as you were developing your signature style, which is often characterized as being fluid or legato, um, was it a case of hearing a sound in your head and trying to develop a technique to capture what you heard in your head, or was it more of an instinctive process of just, you know, doing what felt natural to you? Well, it was both. It was because I originally wanted to play a horn. I wanted, I really wanted to play a saxophone or any uh, wind instrument, really. Yeah, I did play a clarinet for a while, and I experimented with the saxophone later on, many, many years later. But basically, it was like a kind of, um, it was kind of instinctual for me to want to try to get the the guitar to sound a little bit more. Uh, liquid than you know because it uh, as you know it's a percussive instrument mm -hmm. and I tried to get it sound to sound like uh, a not a non percussive instrument you know I I was always striving to try to find a way to make it more fluid that that was all really I guess it was just an unconscious desire to still want to play a saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, another thing that's frequently commented on beyond the actual notes you play is your tone. And with very few exceptions, jazz guitarists tend to favor clean tones, avoiding any hint of distortion you know, at all costs. But you've taken the best aspects of distortion, controlled feedback and warm sustain to create a very rich and pleasant sound. Uh, did you ever experiment with clean tones in your early days, or have you always been drawn to a more rock-oriented guitar sound? No, it was. it's actually kind of a blend, really, because I, liked, uh, I needed to try to use some sort of distortion to assist with the sustain, right. because I know that in order to make it sound more horn-like, I needed to get the notes to be able to be a little bit longer than they would be with a clean tone. Right. However... With the clean sound, I always use a, a, a very clean sound, at least I thought, for the chordal stuff. So oh, it yes. was like a mixture, you know. So, And it was, it was not easy in a way because I, I wanted to try to make it sound fluid, but not really nastily distorted. You know, I was trying to get a more liquid, not so quite aggressive as a regular rock kind of sound. Uh, obviously, your uh, chord voicings are very clean. Uh, you really wouldn't be able to hear the details if those were distorted. I was really speaking of your lead guitar tone. I guess I should have been more specific. Um, no, no, that, that's fine. But that's basically what I did is I tried to you, I tried to control the distortion to a point where it really didn't sound that distorted. At least later on, I just tried to keep pushing myself into trying to find a way to get the, a, a kind of like the sustain without without having a really nasty sound, you know. You're right. It is occupying a middle ground. It, to me, it sounds like a singing voice. It just it just sings. It doesn't. It never sounds unpleasant to me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the compliment. <laughs> <laughs>